start the recording. So today is October 9th, 2015, and this is a, a webinar for Intergenerativity and Innovation with Kristen Bodiford and Peter Whitehouse. And this is the compilation of an online dialogue that we had this week, a uh, dialogue with the authors. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of that conversation this week. It was just amazing and fantastic and wonderful, beautiful stories coming out. And, and I hope that the sharing can continue. And today we wanted to provide a live opportunity for conversation and dialogue and sharing. So. Um, in order to get us started, I would like to have each of you introduce yourself, and we'll just keep it brief so we can jump right into the conversation. And um, just say your name and where you are in the world. And that way we can kind of get a sense of, of who's here and, and all the different locations around the world where we're located. So Ella, I'm going to have you go first. Uh, okay, my name is Ela. I'm from Montreal. I have not been part of the dialogue over the week, I, unfortunately, but I very much look forward to uh, hearing the dialogue today. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Janelle? I'm Janelle Gilbert. I'm in um, Vermont in the United States, and I'm also looking forward to the discussion today. Great. Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Bites, and I'm in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Wonderful. Richard? I'm in a suburb of uh, Denver, Arvada, Colorado. Great. Robin? Hi, I'm in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Okay, good. And Suzanne? Hi there, I'm Suzanne Bauer from Berlin, Germany. Okay, great, wonderful. And then um, I think during the, during the conversation online, we had people coming in from Africa and Brazil and um, I don't know if we had anybody from Asia, but several people from Europe, and um, really it was a, it was definitely a, a global conversation. So thank you everyone for being there. And I just want to introduce Peter and Kristen and thank them for being a part of this um, wonderful week and for, for doing this dialogue today. And they're um, both Taos Associates. Um, the Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization, for those of you who do not, do not know the Taos Institute. Um, we welcome you to come to our website, our regular website. Um, the online community website is, is using a Ning platform for the online dialogues, but then we also have a website at www.taosinstitute.net that is full of resources. Many of them are free. Uh, we've got World Share Books, which is a free download of full-length books available now. We've got lots and lots of pages and pages of articles and um, papers for free download. We've got videos. Um, we offer uh, workshops and, and we have conferences. So we just really welcome you to join in with us um, as you can and, and help with our learning process. We're, we're using social constructionist theory and practice to really help make the world um, come alive with relationship. And um, Peter and Kristen are amazing, amazing practitioners um, that, that do this in their daily life and daily work. So welcome, Peter and Kristen. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Peter, you want to kick us off? I will certainly do that. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. What a wonderful opportunity to have been with um, many of you, but not all, during the week. And uh, we welcome everybody here this morning and this afternoon. Um, I want to certainly thank Dawn for her wonderful organizational abilities and management of this site, and Kristen especially for being a friend and partner in this enterprise, and for doing this wonderful PowerPoint presentation which you're seeing. And what you see on this first slide, Intergenerativity and Innovation, is the photographs of those that were able to join us uh, during the week. And as mentioned, uh, a wide range from, from Africa and Spain and else, elsewhere. Um, my reflection on this slide, before I turn it over to Kristen to kind of tell you what our suggestions are for where we're headed this morning, is to say uh, there are many faces here from Taos, friends and colleagues, some new people I haven't met. That was wonderful. What a wonderful community we have. And one of the features, as I felt this week, was how embracing we were of people who knew nothing 
or little about the Taos Institute, people I had invited, Kristen had invited to join the conversation. So we really extended in a very intergenerative way beyond our own community out into the world as we all do. And I thought that was just a wonderful thing about what happened this week so far. Kristen, to you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Peter, it's just been so fun to work with you on this project. I can't think of anyone who lives intergenerativity more than you do, so it's just fun to learn with you and to experience this. And I, I love, I, I put the first slide up and I was going to put our pictures with the intergenerativity and innovation that, um, that Emily so beautifully made with uh, Dawn and the Patel Institute. And that, oh, no, it's our whole conversation with everyone. And so I wanted to represent that. And it's uh, folks that participated um, online this week, but then I also grabbed photos of people that signed up for the webinar today, since that's part of the whole dialogue. So some of you will see your pictures on there because of that. And uh, Don, when you said the world come alive with relationship, this is what I felt this week. It feels like the world really came alive for me around this topic of intergenerativity. And um, so it's very exciting to see it all, all in uh, one snapshot for me. And I was also reflecting, Peter, uh, that I didn't mean to do this, but one of the things that I loved about the conversation this week was the connections that people made with each other. And I'm looking at um, uh, Susan and Mo and Peter, kind of a line here on the left, that had a wonderful conversation about their work and connections. And so that was uh, purely coincidental, but that was one of the things that just really came alive for me to speak as well. So welcome there everybody. are all kinds of things that all kinds of things that emerged, but one thing emerged yeah. is that Mo and I are going to have dinner in Toronto in a week or so. Uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so thank you everyone for engaging and I think we'll continue the conversation. We'll definitely continue the conversation here, but ongoing. So thank you. Um, let me see here. Why is this not going forward? There we go. Um, Peter and I put together a suggested agenda for a conversation, but what we really want to do is we want to open the conversation for us all to uh, have dialogue around some questions. Don made a very interesting reflection the other day that not everyone has been on the dialogue this week, and so we wanted to just recap for those of you who haven't been on the dialogue or maybe haven't had a chance to read the AI Practitioner Journal, some of the things that struck us. Then we wanted to open up the conversation around some questions about what has what struck us this week online for people that participated, or what's striking people in, in their learning and their own work or life around this theme of intergenerativity, like what brought you here. And then maybe we could talk a little bit about what themes are emerging from that question. Um, we're also, Peter and I are really curious about what difference intergenerativity uh, would make in the world if we're intentionally focusing on intergenerativity and bringing this more into our work or life, what difference would this make in the world? Um, I think it's very aligned with the social constructionist perspective as well, of being aware of uh, how we're relating and what that's creating. And so if we're relating in ways that are intergenerative, can I say that, Peter, intergenerative? <laughs> I wrote that this week. I thought it's not a word. <laughs> I created a word from a word that's not a word. Um, and then what is next? What might we all co-create together? What might emerge from this conversation that's a shared purpose or goal? And then just some closing reflections. And we have an hour and a half budgeted for this uh, webinar. We could take less than that or up to that. Um, so uh, we'll leave it up to us to co-create what this dialogue would be. And if you have any other suggestions, please put it uh, in the question uh, section for Don, or let us know and we'll open it up for discussion. Actually, why don't I pause for a minute? And just ask, um, how does this how does this look for folks? Is there anything missing that they want to make sure that we address? And I, I see Matt. I see you've joined us. Welcome. Yeah, yes. I, I just unmuted you, Matt. So would you like to say your name and where you are in the world? Um, am I am I on mute? Yeah. Oh no, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Sorry to join in late. Um, Matt Kaplan over in the middle of Pennsylvania at Penn State University. Thank you. Great, thanks. And you know, Kristen, we have some. We have a question coming in from Dan, um, and she says, "Can you give an age bracket for dealing with the joint topic of intergenerativity and innovation?" She's dealing with youth ages 18 to 13 in the Middle East, called MENA, and um, so it is them who is asking her. That they are asking Susan. They're asking you about this age bracket of intergenerativity. Is that what you're saying? Right. Exactly. Because. 
they always think that they are getting too old because they are looking for a so-called first-time job seekers, mm -hmm. people who have not have any formal employment for, let's say, the first three years after having graduated in university, you see. Mm. Okay, good. So um, I want to make sure I understand your question, and then I want to see how it might integrate into some of the, the stories that people shared this week as well, and then how we bring this into the conversation. So they're asking you, what's the age bracket of this concept of intergenerativity? Because they're concerned that they're too old in looking at this uh, job seeking um, job seeking status in their life, job seeking role. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Kirsten, uh, what I think is that the fact that they do not have any job right now makes them feel like, oh, maybe if we go into intergenerativity and innovation, what could be innovative in here? Mm -hmm. It's more their position. They want to proactively engage, but they don't know how. Oh. If they have no position. Okay. You know, I, I, can I suggest something here? Please. I love having, whenever um, I do any work around like learning about research or a topic, I love having like a, a design challenge or, or some kind of question that guides us in our thinking about this. Can we, can we take your question and this challenge that the youth are asking about what is the possibility with intergenerativity as they're looking at job seeking in this stage of their life and how might they use this concept? Um, can, can I give this back to the whole group to be thinking about that in terms of um, how we might take some of the lessons learned this week to advise this group of youth that you're working with? Would that be okay? Me, yes. <laughs> okay. Is everyone else okay with that? Yes. Yes. Sounds good to me. And if anyone else has like a challenge that they want to pose to the group for us to think about too, let us know. That would be wonderful. Um, anything else that people would want to make sure that we cover or questions that they have that they want to make sure we have t space to talk about? Uh, this is Richard. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, I want to be sure that we uh, get a chance to really look at the diversity of all kinds um, because in, in my own work I've found that to be really the, the, the exciting, the energy generating element of intergenerativity. When the diversity is radical, the intergenerativity mm -hmm. is really fresh and, uh, and powerful. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. And I, I, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking a little bit about that this morning that I think um, a conversation often goes to diversity of age, but there's intergenerativity allows us to think of diversity of all kinds. So I really appreciate you bringing that in. So if we could be thinking of radical diversity, I love that concept, radical diversity as we're um, t sharing about the stories in our learning, that would be great. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, should we get started? I think, did someone else just join? I think Margaret just joined. Can we have, Mar Margaret, would you be okay saying hi really quick? Yeah, hi, but I'm not sure if you're actually hearing me. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, because I thought my um, equipment suggested I was in listening mode only, which I was okay. happy to do. But if you can hear me, that's great. I'm here in uh, Kirkcordy in Fife. Great. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I don't think there's anyone else. Is there that's joined? No. Okay. Great. And Kristen, so Kristen yeah. before we continue, I just want to remind everyone that you are unmuted, which means you can talk when you need to, but I would ask you to keep yourself on mute, kind of manage your own microphone. You click on the green microphone in front of your name, and that will keep you on mute. So far, the sound is great. Everyone's, there's, there's really no static or background noise, so everybody's doing well um, with that. But if, if we do get some more noise, make sure you keep yourself on mute. Thank you. Great, thanks. And sometimes I think uh, we forget that we're on unmute and a phone call will come in or someone will come into the room and we'll have a conversation. So if that's the case, I think, Don, you can mute everyone, right? If we forget? <laughs> yes, and I was just on mute, okay. so it takes a minute to keep <laughs> yourself on mute, but yes. Good. Okay, great. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, so with this, um, I'd like to turn it over to Peter. And um, Peter is really the the um, what uh, should I say brainchild, Peter, around this concept with others. I think with Richard and others that you've been working with about this concept of intergenerativity. So if I could open it up to you, Peter, and and Richard and others who have been working on this concept together about what intergenerativity means to you, to kind of ground our conversation, that would be great. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Um, the um, intergenerativity is a word that's um, new, literally. Um, as Richard emphasizes, it, the, the, the word the the word is generativity, and then putting different things together to be innovative. We sometimes say that intergenerativity is about going between to go beyond what's future oriented, innovation oriented. I'll tell you two quick stories. Um, the first is that this was inspired by Ken Gergen's writings about generativity that formed the basis of the um, World Appreciative Inquiry Conference in Nepal. Marge Schiller, Lindsay Godwin, I and my wife Kathy wrote a paper for that, um, it, that uh, special uh, conference in which we coined the term intergenerativity, uh, just play on the fact that we have worked in the intergenerational space. If you Google intergenerativity, Mr. Google will sometimes say intergenerational, so he hasn't quite learned the word intergenerativity, which is broader. It means you can take disciplines, professions, countries, uh, people of all kinds of different uh, backgrounds and ideas and put them together. I will tell you one other story, that, that, that one involved March, which involves Richard, who's on the phone here. Richard and I grabbed, that's the right word, the domain name, intergenerativity.com, intergenerativity.org, a writing down from Pikes Peak, uh, which actually created a friendship between Richard and I, if I can say that, uh, and, and a project which we're calling the Intergenerativity Project, which is based in our intergenerational schools. So. As a psycholinguist, to use a, uh, you know, one of my professions, I'm interested in how words get introduced into um, our space, because that's one of the wonderful things about language. It's so creative. You can create new words, seem to fit some kind of need, and then, of course, hitch them to stories. And we're all involved with words and stories at Taos and the people on this call, and see where it goes in the world. So you're part of this creation of this of this concept. Um, unfortunately, Marge is not on the, in the, on the call, but uh, she was a progenitor, and Richard is, and he might want to add to the story I just told. So it's innovation through integration, and uh, it's a future-oriented going between to go beyond. Well, if I can add a little bit, this is Richard, um, to, to to what Peter said. Um, uh, I, I, I feel like... Uh, Oh, there's a, a silly joke somewhere. Somebody it goes. I'll use it for intergenerativity. You know, six months I, ago I didn't know what intergenerativity was, but now I am one. And meeting Peter on Pikes Peak as we rode up and down together to the top of this fabulous vista of Colorado, I recognized that his word intergenerativity, which he quickly introduced me to, had been exactly what I would, had been doing for nearly 25 years utilizing the stories of a community, the individual stories, as a way to bring people together across lines of difference and then to create large cast plays that said yes to absolutely everybody. So the, the, the radical diversity that I've had the privilege to be around for this quarter of a century includes literally anybody who would walk through the door and then reaching out for the people who felt you know, intimidated about walking through the door. So when I think of intergenerativity, I think of it in that community setting, and I think of it is as I look at where the jewels are, where the riches are, they seem to cluster around the edges of a kind of normative group, so that when I get that child with profound mental challenges, you know, when I get literally a baby in arms, weeks old, carried by its mother on stage. When we have a 90-year-old woman who works with us over several years and we watch her dementia increase, but we watch the group enfold itself around her 
to support her continuing interest in being a storyteller to her community in the performance. Those are the things which just light me and I think everybody else up and open up our vistas. So that's intergenerativity to me. I feel like, Richard, a, a little just moment of silence is <laughs> I'm feeling when you talked about those moments, the jewels, I, I wrote down the word awe. Just mo those moments of awe, um, and I think John Schotter and and um, uh, has talked about this. It's like also striking moments. Like we're we're kind of made anew after we experience those moments that you shared. So thank you for sharing those. Um, thank you. That's exactly a, a beautiful way to talk. about we are made anew. Mm. And, and could I just add to that that I am in Phoenix, not my usual home, with my 12-year-old. Well, excuse me, 12 day old <laughs> uh, grandchild, daughter. So there have been lots of intergenerative moments um, in relationship in the community of our family. Uh, and it, it illustrates that it's not just the, the generational difference to the, the, the issue of who, who, where does intergenerativity exist. I think it exists everywhere across all ages, across all nations as, as a concept. Um, and of course, the, the challenge is to bring it to life, and our new granddaughter represents bringing a new human being to life. If, if I could just insert one short thing, you're, you're saying things that remind me of um, words that were uh, attributed to Jesus in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, and it, it, in which he says that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth, but people don't see it. Mm -hmm. And what I think naming it intergenerativity does um, this conversation does is to challenge us to see those jewels. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm, just, I'm kind of like I'm really touched by this, um, and I, I, I often like I think I um, can't remember if it was uh, I think it was Yop had talked about this. Uh, to Zhang in, in his article about people using their whole um, person, so a very holistic approach thinking about intergenerativity or uh, relationships. And right now I feel like you just brought that into the conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm going from shifting from my head down to my heart and back up to my head and connecting the two, so thank you. Um, there's something that, that connected for me too in thinking about some of the stories this week. Um, so Janelle talked about the use of restorative justice, and Janelle, I'll leave it to you to explain that more to the group as we get into our discussion. But for me, restorative justice is reconnecting what's been disconnected, you know, where there's been harm. And so, the, and and I think Peter Nasubaga also talked about that in terms of generational connections, that um, that there's a kind of a fracturing or a separation of generations in many countries, but what he's experiencing in Uganda and that uh, Namara has been experiencing in Uganda is that there's a growing disconnection between generations that has long, the family has long been kind of the, the strength of, of um, societies in, in Uganda. But there's also what I'm hearing from Richard and Peter, this sense of the new. So that we haven't been connected, but we want to make more visible um, when you said people don't see it, Richard, like the, the task is to make those possibilities for connections more visible in a way that we celebrate them. Um, so thank you for bringing that. It, it kind of um, just made it more rich for me. Mm -hmm. um, Linda Bites. Yes. Can I add a, can I add a comment here? Thank you. So I, I really appreciate what, what Richard did, what, what's just said, because for me, two things come up. Okay, so it's ever since. I knew that I was going to be on this teleconference, and I apologize for not being on the dialogue during the week. I was actually in Vermont. <laughs> um, but I, I think about you know the questions you ask determine what you find, and words create worlds. And since this has sort of been brought to the fore of my consciousness, all of a sudden I notice popping up around me are all these examples of uh, intergenerativity. And now the Waldorf School that I was affiliated with in Vermont has done this entire program of knitting together the folks that are in um, a retirement center down the road uh, into the classrooms. 
uh, somebody who is an icon in the field of mediation for me um, just wrote an article about moving from them and us to we, talking about the millennial generation. And then yesterday I'm on an NPR, listening to NPR, and absolutely inspired by, uh, it was part of their global activism series. And they had a, an Israeli scientist, and I have a, a very uh, strong interest in Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict. And it was talking about the Malta conferences. And it was talking about how these group of scientists came together and consciously, um, I don't know how to articulate this, consciously uh, made science their, uh, their relation, uh, to define their relation. So some Chinese uh, woman scientists said, we are ageless, we are genderless, we are countryless. Our, our focus is science. And what they're doing is called the multi-conferences. And what they're doing is absolutely awe-inspiring. But all of this sort of came out of you folks just introducing the, the talents, introducing this to, into my consciousness, and all of a sudden these things just all pop up. <laughs> and I'm I'm just struck by uh, by that, and by looking for opportunities where it's lighting up the world as opposed to where it's dividing the world. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that. Beautiful. Thank you, Linda. Um, I, I, I want to just, oh, did you, was that Don? No, it's Robin. I'll put my hand up. Robin. Oh, there's your hand. I faded. <laughs> and, and I Robin, haven't. I was after going. you go, Robin, I do want to make sure that George, or Greg, I'm sorry, Greg gets a chance to say hi to everyone. But Robin, please go first. Yes, I just want to build on this last comment, and I'm sorry, I missed your name. And uh, What was, would you mind? Linda. Linda, Linda, thank you. And adding to the ageless, genderless, and whatever else, um, what has come up as I was listening to you and also to um, to Richard earlier is borderless. Um, you know, boundary. There's no boundaries to this. So I think you know the fact that it's context agnostic, or what where I'm I'm taking away, and what's important to me is to understand that all these things. Um, you know, we can we can remove ourselves from our specific context, which creates barriers between us. Mm. Thank you, and then Robin, thank you for building on this. Um, and and I want to take a moment to welcome Greg and to say hi. And then I have something to build on what you guys all just said. So, Greg, we uh, had a chance, to, I know you joined as we were talking, so I, I recognize that and I want to make sure you had a chance to say hello and just tell people where you're from and get your voice into the conversation. And you may be muted. Well, I'll come back and check with you. Uh, it may be that you're still on mute. I mean, maybe Don, you can yeah, Chris, help Greg. Greg is not on mute. He's unmuted, but he might he may not have okay sound okay. 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 I'll try. I'll check in again later. Um, one thing Chris, that Chris, oh, go ahead, Peter. I, 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 we we may need to move on from this slide, but yeah. this uh, comment about scientists, I think, and boundaries uh, is so essential because. In, in a language world uh, and in the real world, we are constantly uh, looking for creativity. And I think, as Richard said, it at the boundaries between um, sources of generativity. In fact, in ecosystems, a lot of the evolution of life goes on in these boundary zones. But I think um, what what for today's world, the techno science language is so dominant that. Um, what I'm working on in my own work, my work with Richard and others, is this boundaries between science and the arts and humanities. Because associated with establishing words and boundaries are politics of things, economics of things. And um, words are important because they're tied to structure, they're tied to uh, sources of power in the world. And so this conversation is 
about, as Richard was saying, making sure we empower um, everybody as uh, best we can in a space that doesn't allow certain people to control words and the stories that go along with those words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yes, and, and let's definitely move on. And I, um, I'm i glad that you mentioned that because I, I think what I was going to connect with, with Linda and Robin just got exemplified through the example that you gave of boundaries between science and arts. One thing that struck me as, um, I don't know if anyone's read uh, Keith Haslebow's, Haslebow's um, book, Relational Ethics, but it's a beautiful book. If you haven't had a chance, it's a Taos Institute public publication available on the website, but there was something that uh, struck me when she was talking about context, that context in itself is a social construction. I'm always talking about things are contextual, you have to understand the context. And it really struck me about how the context is, is a social construction, so that brings us the possibilities of looking at things as um, what are the boundaries that we are constructing and how do we reconstruct those, what are the possibilities if we see those as constructions and not as something that's affixed. Although I, I do see that we, we have history and we have um, narratives that hold these boundaries or these contexts in place, but um, we also have the possibility to see that we can reconstruct through new, new, new narratives. So th moving on, um, or before I move on, I do just want to say one thing that also struck me, I think, about what you were saying, Linda, about that you're um, have a new level of consciousness about um, seeing things, noticing things, and you mentioned a knitting together, and then Richard, what you were talking about, I think um, it reminds me of what Mother Teresa said, that the problem is, is that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And I feel sometimes like this is a re-remembering, it's a re-seeing of our belonging to each other and going back to that enter to the we. Um, so thank you for, for um, bringing all those things that just reminded me, because sometimes I forget. and when I remind myself that we belong to each other, it shifts how I'm focusing on how I'm relating, how um, what's being con uh, created in that relationship. Um, I think the next slide just really speaks to the, the second half of um, what Peter was talking about with innovation. The, the great possibility, and I think it's the magic, Richard, that you talked about, and um, of the possibility of when we bring these, these maybe uh, things that have been disconnected or that we have not connected before, making more visible the possibilities of connection, there is this uh, magic that happens that we might call innovation or generativity or emergence. So there's this whole uh, research in, uh, around complexity science and um, emergence that I think that we need to think about with intergenerativity and that might be a possibility for us to uh, explore as a group. It was one thing that Peter and I intentionally this week wanted to just create um, a, a space for us to see what emerged instead of tightly holding it. We wanted to create a container to see what might emerge through our stories and our connecting. And to me, it was just beautiful, the connections that began to strengthen and be made more visible. Peter, can I turn this back over to you? Sure. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I'll just say a, a comment about magic um, that goes back to the conversation about science, I think we really need to re-enchant the world, uh, you know, connect the heart and the brain together. And I'm, I'm working on a, a video game which is about systems thinking, but the magic in that video game is when somebody tells a story. Uh, mm -hmm. So this notion that, that these stories um, uh, are, are, are magic and that we really need to uh, empower ourselves uh, around our abilities uh, as storytellers. Um, mm -hmm. And so this uh, AI practitioner, which um, Anne Radford uh, kindly allowed Mark Schiller, Matt Mulvey, and I to uh, organize with the support of Appreciating People is, is shown right here. This is actually a picture from uh, um, uh, um, a garden project in Austin, Chicago, and I was uh, delighted to be a part of that for a couple a day to, to learn what she's doing there. Um, so this is the, the reading list for those of you that have dived into it. We can include some references to it here. Um, and uh, this is the set of articles um, that was um, divided into themes having to do with uh, intergenerativity in business, intergenerativity in family, intergenerativity methods. Um, so it's, it's, it's another rich um, uh, source that um, 
to uh, include in our conversation space here and thank uh, all the authors, but particularly the authors that were able to comment this week about their own particular chapters. Um, so uh, we, um, I, 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 this reminds me also that one of the last comments on the website before we started uh, this morning was Mark Schiller's suggestion that we um, consider uh, asking Anne and others um, who working with the journal to perhaps make a regular issue on, on intergenerational work. I think it's so important and Dawn this morning suggested we might want to consider books and conferences. So uh, this just allows me before I turn it back to Kristen to say that we are thinking about next steps. What if this conversation is helpful because it's linked to other conversations as we learned uh, this week. Um, what might the next steps be, which is our third question, so I don't want to get us too far ahead, uh, but Kristen, over to you. I think Kristen is muted a little bit, for me anyway. Okay, I was muted, sorry, there you go. thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so Peter and I wanted to kind of give a recap of what we saw emerging um, from the conversations, and it was really hard because, uh, you know, as we look at those interconnections, none of these exist on their own. They're very interconnected. But one, the first one that kind of emerged for us was this concept of being and experiencing. And you'll see the picture of Don's um, family. Thank you, Don, for this photo. The very large picture, picture of a large group of people with the white T-shirts or a story that Dawn kicked us off with about her multi-generational family um, vacation homes where the family all comes together and shares stories and, and culture and experiences. But that struck me out of her conversation was this element of just being and experiencing together, which other people also shared um, stories um, talking about uh, co-housing together, and I, I grabbed a picture of an intergenerational co-housing um, project. Um, and Giovanna talked about uh, the sense of being and experiencing that she wants her children to have with her in-laws in a village in Lebanon, and so I took a picture of a, a movie of a, a young man wanting to learn more from his grandmother in Beirut. And uh, Marge talked about her experience and her family with her grandchildren and the beauty and the power of that, and she shared a video with us. And then connected to um, uh, the conversation about co-housing, uh, Don had recommended Mary Gerben's new book, Retiring But Not Shy, that there's a story about a group of women who are at var varying stages of retirement who um, bought a house together and are learning to live together and navigate retirement. And so just this element of being and experiencing. And there were other stories as well that were connected to that. And Peter, go ahead and interrupt me if you want to add anything on. But I thought I'd go through these pretty quickly so we could get to some conversation. Uh, please go on. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, that's just on. Okay. one for me. OK, so the next one was that came in was mentoring. And um, Mo and Marie McKenna started off with talking about her article um, that she co-authored in the journal about mentoring as ageless. And this is a picture of Jane uh, Watkins and Alex and what she learned through this mentoring relationship with different ages, which then sparked other connections. Um, Matt, I think you shared the resources that exist around mentoring, um, that they're, uh, I think I put this, the, I don't think this is the right one. Sorry, Matt. You were talking about the the mentoring handbook that uh, was written out of Temple Intergenerational Center. You might you might need to remind me about what it was called. Um, mentor Up was another organization through AARP Foundation that is engaging young people to mentor up um, to other ages. And then it reminded me of a story um, about mentoring. Um, Mo's story reminded me of a young man in Uganda who is mentoring me around um, chicken husbandry and, and developing chicken farming that we're working on in Uganda. Um, so you'll see his picture there, Martin. And then um, I, think, I can't remember who, I think it was Mo, again, who shared this video. Was it Mo or Janelle that shared the video about this young man who really wanted to um, make available to his village and to his grandma, to the grandmothers, um, what he was able to access on the internet. So he came up with a notice board in his village. It was very creative. 
Um, so there was a whole theme of mentoring um, that was discussed online and in the articles. Peter, do you want to talk? I know this one's really close to your heart. Do you want to talk about this one, storytelling? Sure. I think um, this is at the heart of um, how I think we are uh, intergenerative. And um, uh, the, uh, the comment I was going to make on the, on the last slide was the importance of uh, technologies because um, I visited the farm in Uganda with uh, Kristen with Peter uh, walking around with his uh, cell phone on Skype and remarkably in Africa we had a great signal so I was able to visit that place and learn their story through that mobile phone um, walking around the garden and the farm um, so in this modern world we uh, I think we, we, we have the power that we can go beyond sitting around a fire um, which is, of course, still a nice thing to do, uh, and that uh, leads us into Joe Lambert. Um, uh, Joe uh, runs the Center for Digital Storytelling, and um, that's his book featured um, uh, where he talks about uh, the evolution of our abilities to, to tell stories and to, um, to, to, to share them in ways that we hadn't had before. Up in the right-hand corner um, is, is Richard Gere, who's on the uh, call his book, Story Bridge from Alienation to Community Action, uh, the, the approach we're using um, on community performance uh, at the Intergenerational School in Cleveland, and he's using particularly in communities that are challenged by alienation. Uh, so uh, Richard's uh, this, I love metaphors, and I think that metaphors of stories as bridges um, is another connecting metaphor that I think is, is really powerful. So I guess my um, appreciation is for all stories told and um, for the new ways we can create and tell stories, which are at the heart of my work, um, in, or my work with Kathy, my wife, in the intergenerational school, and also in healthcare with things like narrative medicine and narrative health. So there's some resonances to that wonderful slide. And again, Kristen, I'm just reliving everything and expanding my horizons as I see your wonderful PowerPoint. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for. Can you keep going with this one? <laughs> sure. Um, forgive me for not remembering who brought the big university to our attention. It was Robin. Um, yeah. Robin, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, so, and, and here's uh, Glenn's uh, uh, school, uh, the bishop, uh, David, um, my screen is blocking, the bishop, right? Bishop David, what's the name of that school? The David Bishop School. Oh, David bishop. bishop David Brown, good yeah. grief, you can't move your screen around. Oh, sorry, I um, didn't know that was no, 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 that's, that's my fault. Uh, sometimes the technology is uh, easier than you think it is. And, and, and the, the images on the, on the left-hand screen, uh, uh, side are from our intergenerational schools in, in, in Cleveland, and of course people will recognize the Taos um, and the whole concept that Ken um, and, and many other people have been promoting of relationship and that um, Kristen was referring to. So in, let me, let me just say, in the schools, and I know a little bit about Bishop David Brown, mentoring, relationships, particularly for disadvantaged kids in our schools, to have older adults uh, who take a sincere and genuine interest in their future and who are uh, fascinated by the stories that, uh, that they learn from the adults from the, the past is so critical. Um, David Brooks, um, thank you, Robin, um, wrote something which I, so on this slide we've got K-12, uh, public, private, uh, the, the Bishop David Brown is 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 um, involved in the arts for I think uh, kids who have some some challenges, but this whole notion that so-called higher education, um, as we were doing this, uh, Kristen and I were sharing stories about the challenges of university bureaucracies. This whole notion that um, universities are not um, stepping up to the plate. Once again, in my mind, it's the compartmentalization of knowledge, the domination of the sciences. And we need to create these spaces, which I consider, and, and David Brooks wrote about, and Robin, I'd be interested in your comments about this, which are really more spiritual places where a community can be created that allows these kind of powerful experiential relationship, learning relationships to evolve. And back to the last slide, the challenge will be, as we introduce all these technologies uh, into um, 
learning and to education, how can we use them to promote relationships and not to disrupt them uh, in ways that perhaps may disempower people and uh, in the learning that's possible. So wow, yeah, and thank you Taos again for supporting this uh, enterprise we're about, uh, for sharing this morning. Could I share a real life um, example of how I think technology can support and bring people together? Um, we had some young ladies that we worked with under restorative justice that couldn't understand at 13 and 14 why they weren't allowed to drive. Mm -hmm. So they took mom's vehicle and the friends and the daughter took a ride around town and came to us. They really couldn't understand why a society would not allow them on public roadways. And so we gave them a flip camera and had them go and interview people in the community and ask them the question, do you think 14-year-olds should be allowed to drive? Why not? And, mm -hmm. and kind of get some feedback by people who weren't, you know, uh, in a restorative action, even though we try to make it a done with process, it does feel a little bit um, dictated. And so we really wanted them to go out and just choose who they were going to ask this question of and get the feedback. And so in that way, I think we were able to use technology in a way that connected the kids and gave them a barrier, to um, the barrier that they needed to ask the question. Mm -hmm. mm. I love that example, Janelle. Thank you for sharing that. It actually reminds me, I think, Linda, you might like this with your focus on dialogue as well, um, that what you did to me, Janelle, represents that you opened up a dialogue the opportunity to be in conversation and see what emerges from that. And I remember when I was doing my doctoral research, all the kids were saying, like, hey, you know, you see me in a black hoodie and, you know, I'm sagging and you, you automatically make a judgment of me because of how I look, how I dress. And when I asked people to read my dissertation and hear what the kids were saying, they said, well, why do they dress that way then? If they, <laughs> if they see that that this is the way the world responds to that, why do they dress that way? And I said, wouldn't that be a beautiful conversation? So Janelle, I wish I would have thought of that to have them go out and interview people. Like, what do you think when you see this? And why do you think that? And just to engage in conversation. What a beautiful way to, to uh, allow that to merge. I also want to go back, and maybe Robin, you can comment on this, that um, the, the thing about the David Brooks article, I think that struck and Peter Nasubiga posted the piece about the transformative potential of, and you were saying, uh, P, uh, Peter, about as having a spiritual place that's community, um, it's a, that's building community, and I think that that's the magic at Hope for Youth Uganda, and the, the secondary students are going to be doing an appreciative inquiry research project about the magic of Hope for Youth, and I think what they'll find is part of that is that they've built such a sense of community. Um, they use performance um, and the arts, like the all stairs from Eastside Institute, there was a connection there with Susan because they're both part of the All-Stars Network. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot of learning in that. So thank you for sharing that, Robin. Uh, do you want to say anything else about Robin to add on to that? Um, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Kristen, I am um, just unmuted myself. Um, no, I think um, the way that Peter um, brought it up kind of reflects my thinking too and it was, I mean two pieces stood out and I've actually got the article open in front of me just to remind me but it was it was definitely, I mean his reference to Maria Popova's brain pickings and the Nietzsche quote. Mm -hmm. I just love to read and he talks about how to find our identity and he and she, he's quoting Nietzsche here, let the young soul survey its own life with a view of the following question. What have you truly loved thus far? What has ever uplifted your soul? What has dominated and delighted it at the same time? Mm. And to me it was like, you know, if we can if we can come to this space from time to time, I think it does help us reconnect with um, mm. who we really are and the magic that you're talking about and the fact that we are um, in this world together. Mm. It, it, if I could just add to that, and I think it's true in many places where we bring people together across the generations, 
and, and the stories that have been shared this morning, some of them illustrate this, it's really important for adults, and I'll use that you know, broadly as non-elders and, um, and, and, and non-youth, to, 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 to create the space to allow the voices of youth to emerge. In our school, mm -hmm. young folks are the ones who know the technology, as you might imagine, uh, better in some, you know, than the older folks. So that's a place where the learning is reciprocal. So I think mentorship can be, should be reciprocal, particularly if you put it into this intergenerative generational um, frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that uh, that reminds me too of what Mariana was talking about a little bit to Peter. Um, the quote here, I believe in you, where he was talking about the space that he tries to create in his classes, in his sociology classes. Um, really with this belief of I believe in you and I, I connected it to also that I see you, um, I believe in you, so this relational orientation that creates a safe space for people to be able to have their voice and their capacities and their strengths seen and heard and appreciated. So, thank and, you. And just, just to introduce Mariano to the group since he's not on the call, uh, Mariano is a colleague of mine and Matt Kaplan who is on the call. We're all academics, uh, Mac, uh, for, for better and worse. Uh, uh, Mariano is a professor of sociology at, at Granada University in Spain and very active in um, matters intergenerational uh, worldwide. And, and, you know, I think um, Matt mentioned uh, Temple University. Uh, I would also commend to those of you that don't know um, the, the group Generations United. Uh, GU.org, I think it is. Um, th there are some places in the world to go where this wisdom of, of uh, specific attention to intergenerationality uh, and to intergenerational programs really are great resources. And just to comment on Matt's comment on the website, um, Matt is new to Taos and new to AI, so welcome Matt and everybody else who did become knowledgeable about Taos. But he, he commented about how many of the ideas he finds in the intergenerational space resonant with the um, AI space, uh, you know, the empowerment that Kristen just mentioned, story and so on. And I think that's uh, another strategy. Um, sometimes there are lots of ideas that emerge in the world, uh, lots of economic rethinkings. Um, Ken Gergen at the the Taos Associates Jamboree was talking about the future of social construction. So essentially, go back to Kristen's comment, we're talking about the, the social construction of social construction. And as he talked about that, I thought of transdisciplinarity, I thought about mm -hmm. feminist studies. So the energies that come together to create a story that brings together uh, radical, dis diverse ideas, but, but that have a common core. Um, that, that is important, I think, for the uh, survival and flourishing of our species as part of what this is all about. And I think that probably goes back to what Richard was talking about, too, about radical diversity. The diversity and sustainability of our species is, is uh, very highly interconnected, is it not? Um, right, and I, I would just come back before we move on to the, the next yeah. slide. The, the, one of those images is um, from the Shaker Nature Center, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the projects we did in the intergenerational school, and it connects to some other legacy work, is this important concept of, of legacy. Mm -hmm. Some elders in our community saved that nature center 50 years ago uh, with some activism uh, to keep a politician from putting a highway through it. So this story is told in the school of how um, we have to, as, as we said in an article we wrote, we have to pass activism across the generations. Mm -hmm. So the kids can see the community, uh, uh, the kids can see the past of the community through the eyes of the elders. And once again, to come back to the role of making sure we empower the voices of kids um, and youth, they have and will be the creators of the future. Uh, so elders can imagine the future through the eyes of the kids. So this idea we can extend our temporal thinking through intergenerational work, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah, that reminds me, too, of this All Together Now uh, project with uh, Center for Digital Storytelling about um, intergenerational dialogue about purpose and service, and it was, um, you guys, uh, I can send a link to everyone to find the digital stories that were created about people's action and civil rights in the civil rights movement or actions that people are taking in their community. It's a wonderful compilation of that. 
um, the extending the temporal uh, notion, the, the sense of time through intergenerational work or bringing generations together reminds me of the uh, notion of set, thinking about se seven generations um, and thinking about my life as being the first, the, the, the oldest person in my life still alive and the youngest person when they'll be dead. So if we, ex if we think about extending the sense of time, um, it just reminded me of that. Can I interject something? This yes, is Richard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think so far we've uh, you brought up Kristen the uh, the word awe and and Peter brought up the word magic and I want to <clears throat> sound um, stand up or sound off about uh, a quality of intergenerativity that I would think of as a kind of tertiary level. You know, if we if we think of the connections that. Uh, the possibility of listening, of story, create. That's rather like the, you know, the um, amino acids as they link together to form the code of DNA. Mm -hmm. But when a group is invited to do this process together, as I've watched for years with a community that comes together to share stories, to winnow them in the ways that they think are important to, to winnow them and then to bring them into performance. They have this other element that I think of as, you know, as DNA not only holds information as in a linear form, but it has this tertiary form in which it doubles back on itself and coils up. And all those proximities have much to do with how with its information carrying potential. So here's what happens, I've noticed that happens in communities with stories, that out of a group of stories speaks the intelligent field that people are very happy to call God, and I don't have any problem with that. Um, I, I, I've come to recognize it and expect it, that in the constellation of our stories, if we listen to them not as a, a sequence only, but for the voice that speaks through them, I think of that as story with a capital S, that there is wisdom of another sort entirely. And I'm going to somehow link you to a little workshop that I did at the Brushy Fork Institute just a couple of weeks ago. And it's a 16-minute video of a group of about mm -hmm. 13 people who put together a performance out of the stories that they shared and winnowed over a, two days of a conference. And you can sense in this what the very core of the Kentucky experience is in uh, challenged communities in eastern Kentucky where so many um, of our most challenged communities in America lie. So I'll somehow uh, post that um, and you can sense this tertiary level, the awe and the magic that I'm talking about. Thanks. That's wonderful. Thank you. That, that brings me back to, I think, a question that, Peter, you asked in the discussion, too, about this concept of collective wisdom. Like, how do we think about this as a collective wisdom? I think, Richard, is that what you're talking about, is this capital S story? Yes, absolutely. That's another collective. synonym for it. You can call it okay. intelligent field, collective wisdom, the collective human genome. I heard one of the people in my workshop uh -huh. use. I loved it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And I just want to pause for a minute and see if there's anyone else that has a comment or a question maybe for Richard on what he just said or... Well, this is Linda. I, I, something that I, I really picked out of what Richard said that I have been thinking about a lot is um, how we capitalize on multiple intelligences of, you know, of who we're being with um, in our organizational lives in particular is what I think about it. You know, and I, I work in the realm largely of education, and and I, I really strive to support people in um, capitalizing on all the intelligences within within an organization, as opposed to uh, separating themselves uh, based on what I would call they're already listening about another person in the organization. But, so I want to take that example and I, or that, that idea of already listening because I'm trying to get to, okay, what's the essence of what enables us to actually be present to the other and, and then be able to unlock that, you know, that intelligence, that wisdom, all those things. And it, it really this concept of presence, being able to be totally present to someone is something that 
you know, it, it floats around a lot for me in, in social spheres and things. Uh, you know, I, I read about it more in, you know, spiritual work. and But I just had the most unbelievable experience two weeks ago of being at the first ever um, Ultimate Culture Conference here in Chicago. And it was a room full of about 200 plus people who work in organization development, largely in business. Okay, so I want to move from just community and, and education to where do we see this getting unlocked, these, these potentials getting unlocked in business. And so this gentleman gets up, he's 80 years old, his name is Larry Sim, and he is a guru in organizational development. He's worked with about 125 or Fortune 500 companies in the world. And, and he starts talking about the work that he's doing. And he's talking about teaching people, first of all, he's talking about the importance of purpose and transcendent purpose in organizations and developing the relational field so that an organization can begin to even conceive of, of achieving breakthrough results. And he actually, you know, but so I go to his website and I look at some of the downloadable materials and I, and in his curriculum, or I don't maybe it's not the right word to use, but in the work that he's doing with people, he's teaching them to be present to one another and to counteract this already listening that we come to our conversations with. And I want to go back to the, to the, you know, to the person in the hoodie, whoever commented above you know, the, the person in the hoodie, how we, we have an already listening about that person in the, you know, who, who mm -hmm. looks like that. Or we have our already listening about, I mean, we do it all the time as human beings, we have our already listening. And how critical to accomplishing what it is that we're talking about here is the concept of being present and be here now. So it's just, I'm just excited about this. I, you know, it's not something that, you know, most of the circles I run in are talking about this happening in business. And so it was really, truly, you know, inspiring for me to, to know that that um, that that's happening in that in that you know industry. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Richard, do you there's, have? You there's have a you, this is Richard. There's a, a a wonderful book that Peter and I are both acquainted with called Reinventing Organizations uh, by Frederick Lalo L A L O U X, and it's uh, it's about the organizations around the world who are operating in this new paradigm way and are just doing brilliantly at it, I found it as kind of endless source of inspiration and I don't, as, a, as an artist all my life, uh, I don't read many business books. Um, so, and, and then in terms of what, uh, what else Linda said, I, yes, absolutely, I think we are, we are coming to a point where the values which in my world have been thought of by others and even by myself because of course we, we, we are in the culture too, even the community-based artists as myself, so we, we swallow this stuff. The, the belief that processes which do the things we're talking about are rather kind-hearted but soft-headed and in an age <laughs> of challenging economics we need to find, you know, strong sort of test-oriented solutions. It's great to hear that this uh, individual, Larry Sim, was it? I'd love to get a. It's Larry. Uh, yeah, Larry Sen, S E N N. Sen Delaney and Struggles is the name of the thing of the. Larry company. S E N N. Right. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear about that because he's uh, preaching out of our same chapter. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to respond to that. It's so funny. Now, here, this is another example that just <laughs> so interesting. I just um, my first ever contribution to a book is getting published this this November, and my chapter is uh, positive strength based change: a revolution in organizing. And I'm and this book is in the context is written in the context of how appreciative schools. Uh, it's called a positive manifesto: how appreciative schools can transform public education. Mm -hmm. And so. It's so interesting, Richard, to have you reference that book because that's the book that's one of my major sources, that, you know, my, my literature sources for talking about positive strength-based change in organizations. So, hey, man, I'm sorry. You said, "Amen, sister." Sorry. 
like, but it's like all of a sudden that book is show. And I'm at an organizational development conference a couple of weeks ago, another one, and and someone says the most inspiring book I've read in the last decade is Frederick Lou's book. <laughs> just, you know, this all gets woven together. So thank you. I, I, I don't know if you're, Oh, I want to pause here for a Sorry? minute because I see, I see Margaret's hand up, so I just wanted to pause for a minute for that. I guess I, I go back to the, uh, and Robin's hand is up too. <laughs> Margaret, did you have something? Yeah, but if, if Robin has something that's maybe very much built on that, I've just been listening intently and I've realized that there's a whole strands of things of an experience that I had in the last couple of weeks about being on holiday and it's it's actually linking a lot of the words and themes that you've been talking about. But you might want to check with Robin if hers is okay. specifically on this article and then I can come back. Okay, wonderful. Robin? Well, thank you, Margaret. Um, mine was related specifically to Frederick Laloux's work. I mean, I, I know the book. I, I heard Frederick speak when he was in New York City recently and he builds very much on the work of Ken um, Ken Wilber, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of um, spiral, you know, he he talks about the teal organization and the evolution of human consciousness and how that then relates into our organizational context. So I'm just jumping in here with another endorsement of um, of that that body of work, and I do appreciate the um, link or the, the reference to Larry Sen. So thank you. Okay. Can I just uh, jump in to bring another theme uh, that was in the AI practitioner? We had a theme on business, and one of my graduate students, Candace Steele, had an article there about the challenges of using generational labels, um, millennials, baby boomers, whatever. Again, another illustration of the power and dangers of labels. But I wanted to just focus on the economic word I think Kristen used and the business world, because we haven't talked about that domain yet. And you know, I'm reminded that at Case Western, David Cooperwriter and uh, a number of us have this uh, business as an agent for the world benefit. And uh, it seems to me that um, in this space, which I'm seeing this dialogue slide, uh, you know, with the, the, the incredible uh, growing divisions between those very wealthy in the world, many of them um, business leaders, and and the, and the impoverished. And it seems to me that. One of the things we've got to do, uh, in my view, is to create a different conversation about money and wealth. And, and wealth is a word that doesn't mean money. We, we have to get wealthy as a species in a more distributed way, which certainly involves um, uh, us, um, quite a bit less uh, uh, putting all the power and in, uh, money into, into one particular source. But th there's a narrative here that I think we have to create about the importance of business, but the fact that Business as a model needs to shift to be more of an agent for world benefit and not for the empowerment of the relatively few. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really like where you're going with that, um, you know, because I think that the data that we're seeing and, and what I and what was revealed in this conference last week, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is Linda, was that they already know that. They know that if they exist only to you know, when I say they, I mean uh, it's 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 surfacing in the data that's being collected on productivity. That productivity uh, only only increases dramatically when uh, there's meaning to work, and that meaning to work only comes about if people are connected to a higher purpose. So there's this thread that's running through all this that's really beautiful in my eyes, you know, and in my heart and my mind. It's like I'm just it's like uh, even what I said earlier. Look at little, you know what my how my speaking sounded. Like business is out there. Like oh my gosh, I'm surprised that it's happening in business. It says you, that you know it, it tells me something about how I've uh, sectioned off, you know, those folks, if you will, <laughs> as if they're not connected to their hearts and their minds and, and, and you know how they are in the world. Mm -hmm. And so. I just I, I love it that you brought us back to business as an agent for world benefit because the data supports that only when that's happening is does true productivity really skyrocket. 
Thank you. And I, I'd like to transition over to Margaret. And before before I do that, Margaret, just really quickly, I would remind Peter, you were talking about this increasing inequality in the world and much of it um, because of our economic models and values. And I was reminded of uh, the research on happiness, that it's not necessarily, it's the, um, the research is showing, I guess the research that, that I was listening to was around actually countries that had less inequality definitely increasing wealth and economics to a degree, but it was more the inequality. The more that we reduce inequality and help people live at a, a standard of living that is fair, um, those are the happiest countries and the happiest. So I think thinking about that is <clears throat> critical. And it reminds me of as we increase inequality, we increase disconnection. Um, so it counter, it's counter to what I think our conversation is about wanting to increase our connection and understanding. Um, and as we do that, I think we, I like to think of it as spontaneous compassion. We do what we think uh, we need to do to support each other and support societies. Um, and can I, can I transition over to Margaret? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Can, yes. can yeah, good. Okay. Um, it's probably just linking a number of words and themes that um, mm -hmm. you've been talking about, and it links very much to things I've been focusing on recently. And also, I was over in a small town called Boza, E O S A, in Sardinia. And um, all the things that you've been talking about, like the storytelling, the head and the heart, um, the listening, um, the intergenerational are really encapsulating what I experienced when I was in holiday because this is a very small, very old-fashioned town where people in the Italian um, style will all congregate in the square walking about in the evening and the children all come together at a set time in the square and they all play together and it's like swarming of birds. You can hear all this chattering and it's all the, vo the voices of the children playing together and the, the parents sit round the edge and they're chatting away and then at a, an appointed time it's like birds taking off again they all disappear to go home and have something to eat and head for bed or whatever they're doing the next day um, but I was talking to two friends about my experience which is very much about the head and I just came back feeling that I had remembered who I was and someone on the course I was on because it was also a sort of development workshop was saying remember what remember means. It means remembering, putting back together. And I actually came back totally refreshed, feeling I had been put back together. And when I discussed the experience of being in that town, a friend who knows the Italian way of life said, ah, but you see, you were in an old style Italian town. And there's no uh, disconnect between the town and the people. They are one. The whole way the town's constructed and the way the people use the town, it's they are one and the same. It's not like some of our cities and communities where people commute or flash through or they don't really want to live there. People are really rooted in the community. Um, and that linked again to me to something I happened to read at the beginning of um, uh, Gladwell's recent book, The Outliers, where he talks about the village Rosetta, which moved a lot of people from Italy moved to uh, the States and they actually built the village in the model of where they'd come from and when they did research they discovered that the people in that village in the States were amazingly healthy, there were no heart attacks and they went to investigate it and of course they discovered that yeah, it wasn't the continental diet having brought over, a lot of it was to do with the relationship and there were three generations usually living in one house in the Italian model. And I'm just wondering about um, the way that we live now is just feeding into that sort of disconnect. Um, and I've just been at a discussion today where we were talking in the medical world about stories and the stories that people might tell about the way they deliver a service or the way they receive a service and how do we challenge people to tell different stories but just everything that you were talking about was linking my experience of feeling um, rejuvenated from being in this town and thinking about 
I would love to do some stories if my Italian was better. <laughs> I could love to do some stories in that town about how people live, how they see things, how they see the intergenerational issue. Um, and in the work that I've done using AI, it, th th there's always been, and Peter used the word magic, and I have described um, Boza as being magic to various friends, but in my experience, when you work with young people and older people in the room, there is a magic, something happens, something magical happens. Um, and when I think about piece of work that I've done, there's been an absolutely critical, just simple question asked. For example, when I went doing work in schools, I, I asked one of the pupils, just as we were about to start an event, how do you think we could actually um, communicate some of this to, um, what would be the best way to communicate or work with the school? And in an instant, no hesitation came back, you should work with the first years um, because they're actually going to be with you for six years. Don't work with the six years because they'll be going off to university because they'll vanish from the horizon. But if you instill something in the first years, they'll be with you for six years or four. And don't go too far up the school because they want to be cool and they're not going to get too involved with, you know, so catch people early in the school system. And I've just found that when I've done work like that, sometimes we struggle with the complexity and actually when you just ask someone in the system in those age ranges, you get an amazingly insightful answer back and it gives a huge burst of energy. I'll stop there. Great. Uh, I could just add that um, Peter Senge says that children do systems thinking naturally. We adults are the ones that start carving up the world and kind of losing our ability to, 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 to connect that uh, complexity. I think your story about that community um, reminds me that we are reinventing community. There's dementia-friendly communities, there's age-friendly communities, there's nature-friendly communities, there's blue zones, some of people may have heard about, uh, which sounds like your community in Italy, where people live happy, productive lives, and it has more to do with relationships than diet, and certainly more to do with those things than it does with healthcare systems. The thing I was going to go back to, you said remembering. Kristen, in the very beginning of this conversation, used the word belonging. And, and that is a defining word uh, for Peter Block and others at community. And I, I, I don't know if you can um, uh, you take that apart, but belonging. It's like, you know, to be, you long to be, but you put those together and you get your belonging. Uh, in a community, um, so I, I just wanted to emphasize what I think, uh, and I think schools ought to be at the center of this reinvention of communities. Thank you. I just wanted to check in because we're almost actually at the end of our hour and a half. I couldn't believe it. I just checked my watch. So I think we've been kind of mixing the questions in with us and the dialogue in. I, I noticed, Robin, that you have your hand up, and I don't know if it's up from the last time you had it up or if you have a new. Is there, did you have something? I know you're probably muted. Oh, it's down now. Okay. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do, uh, Peter, what do you think of skipping for the last eight minutes to. Um, we just, just talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> we just, yeah, I just wanted to. Noticed there were a couple other themes that we had noticed of of uh, community building, which I think we've been talking about, and people can go and read online as well. And this and this sense of that you talked about with the arts and performing, and I had to put that picture of you in there as the tree, um, <laughs> so people can read more what others shared about performing online. And then also Matt, I think you had also noted that there are so many resources out there already, and you spoke to some of these, Peter, with Generations United. Um, Matt um, has been involved with the Journal of Intergenerational Relationships at the United Nations. There's a book on intergenerational solidarity, um, and so there's there's a uh, there's a whole movement around. Well, there has been a whole movement. It's not a new movement around intergenerational relationships. And then going back to um, what Richard posed to us in the beginning too, to think about um, you know radical diversity beyond just age and generations as well to other uh, things with multicultural, um, across all these sorts of boundaries that we have have, uh, have fixed. 
So with that, I wanted to maybe get to this piece for the last five minutes, or, or this piece. What do you think, Peter? Well, uh, we have a few minutes left. I think what is next okay. uh, might be a good, good way to, to think okay. about the, 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 the has have been on the the Ning. Um, do we do more writing? Do we do more conferencing? Do we do more uh, similar events like this? Um, so I I leave it open to the group to see what they think we might uh, take as next steps moving forward. Okay. Any any thoughts or ideas? I certainly this is. I mean the last question it. brings us yeah. to shared purpose. I'm very interested in these what next co-creating where our conversations might take us um, shared purpose and goal so I'd love to hear this continue it's been very rich for me I have appreciated the doc, uh, dialogue also that um, you know the reading the reading kind of feeds into some thinking but it, it's these kind of conversations that really put a spark into the creativity I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, this is Matt. <clears throat> For me, uh, the value of this, this uh, conversation so far is really um, understanding the elements of the common core, as Peter put it. So sort of seeing uh, you know, some of the common issues and, uh, and challenges that uh, pe people from different perspectives have in trying to move forward um, this kind of work that is generative and intergenerative. So uh, it's hard for me to know what's next, but I do find uh, bigger understanding each other's disciplines and perspectives of the first step. This is Richard. I just want to suggest that we share our inspirations in some ways, whether it's book titles or, uh, you know, resources. Uh, a lot came up that I didn't uh, want to interject, but uh, maybe we can share those in some simple way. Okay. Any other ideas, reflections? Um, I think I think one way that we might be able to send. So I'm, I'm hearing, you know, the conversation is valuable. Learning from each other's perspectives and disciplines, being able to share inspiration and resources, and maybe um, ideas for what we might co-create, like book titles. We, um, I'm sure, could continue to use the the Taos Online uh, discussion area. Um, Don, I'm speaking for that. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I was I was um, going to say I would like to invite everyone to um, jump right back on the Ning discussion area for this uh, week's conversation and keep it going and invite others to join and, and maybe Kristen and Peter can um, agree to check in that conversation space periodically and and you can load your resources there and. Um, about videos and invitations to each other. Uh, it, it can be a space for ongoing conversation for weeks and months to come. Thank you. And, I, and then, then maybe we might schedule something that might be more of a live conversation uh, periodically to continue the sharing the inspiration and, and figuring out what might emerge from our continued conversations. Oh. If I could just add, um, I mean, one of the reasons I emphasize Common Core and the issues and perspectives and methods is sometimes we could get locked into issues of language and lexicon. I know the history of the intergenerational field, some of it was brutally hard to sit through. Mm. Like some recurring meetings, we'd spend half the meeting talking about, like, defining terms. Mm. And it, uh, it could be really kind of rough. So, you know, I like the perspective, let's say, that the Gergens take with the Positive Aging newsletter. I mean, they use it in the title, Positive Aging, but it's not in every story. And people come to it from where they're coming from, and they can all relate to it without necessarily needing to use the term Positive Aging. So I'm kind of learning not to use the, the word intergenerational in everything I say. So although I can appreciate it, and now I'm understanding it more, so that's becoming part of me. But I don't know if necessarily I would need to say this is a meeting on intergenerational or intergenerativity if I want to bring new audiences to a discussion. 
I think okay. that's a little bit of a, a challenge of working across systems. Mm -hmm. I know Marge brought up on the conversation space the the term multi-generational. I don't I don't know how that shifts the ideas and conversation, but it might. Well, I, I think she brought it up in a way to be uh, to to give a critique. I'll just bring generations together is not necessarily the inter the interactive part. So you know that's certainly a critique that I know that folks in the intergenerational world really that resonates with them as well. So that's another common core uh, perspective. You know, and uh, there are, there's a lot of criticism, a uh, critique going on of age-friendly communities because it's just talking about parallel coexistence and not necessarily integration. So I think that really. Uh, you know, is a common core um, concern with those who do appreciative inquiry um, <clears throat> in terms of community work and so on, and those who do so-called intergenerational perspective work. But again, there I go into labels, so maybe we need to transcend <laughs> that. What so I heard you say that too. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Peter. Well, I mean, just, just at that point, every time I talk about age-friendly communities, I try to change that into the conversation about aging, meaning it's a lifespan kind of perspective. But the word um, multi uh, to inter uh, is played out in the multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary space, fostering actual conversation. Now we're into a transdisciplinary space. Uh, and so this whole notion that um, words can guide us, but uh, you know, my, but every time you use a word, uh, you need to think a little bit about what does that word do for us that's positive, and what does that do uh, word do that's um, it's potentially narrowing. And I'm not on this conference call, but I just suggest the words transgenerative, because I think <laughs> intergenerative is basically pretty trans to start with. But Matt, I appreciate your comment because I've been in that intergenerational space and know how much. And listen, I'm in the Alzheimer's space. What a word mm -hmm. that has just distorted. Uh, the way we want to respond to uh, people with age-related cognitive challenges. So, yeah, words, um, you need to use words. Um, they matter, but we need to constantly be thinking about what, what they're doing to us in terms of positive and negative. And I think or, if I could I, kind of connect with, oh, go ahead. I was just going to wrap us up here, Kristen. Oh, let me close with one thing and then we can wrap up. I, I want to go back to, because I think sometimes when we get caught up in, like you were talking about Matt, talking about the language and the terminology, I felt myself shift back to kind of like this brain um, thinking and the intellectual piece of it. The, and I think what Richard also was talking about before was kind of consciousness raising, um, which is the whole self and the piece where we, when we tell those stories and we connect at that deeper level, um, feels to me like it's more like a consciousness raising and movement in that area. So I encourage us to think about ways, and Matt, you talked about creating a space that invites people into conversation where they are. That, that was one thing that you saw with the Positive Aging newsletter. I hope that that's a good translation, I think, of what I heard you say. So I think what the invitation is, is how do we invite others, how do we continue the conversation in a way that holds all of this, com this ability to move us together and raise our consciousness and create new possibilities um, for the world, and how do we do that in a way that invites people into the conversation where they're at and not get stuck being conscious of language and terminology and how we're talking about things, but not getting stuck there, creating ways that creates a safe environment for inviting people in. That's a, that's a nice challenge. I, I want to, this is Richard, I just want to point out a, uh, a really loving critique and I don't have any way to uh, suggestion to overcome it. But if you look at all of our pictures, you'll see that radical creativity isn't um, immediately evident. <clears throat> We're sort of all of sort of middle in, in lifespan, or broadly anyway. This vehicle is not going to easily include babes in arms, or very old people, or people with very different abilities, or even a really creative six-year-old. That's not saying it's bad or wrong. I don't mean that at all. But I, I challenge us to um, to figure out, you know, how to, to, to do better at that. I, th I think, Richard, and, and um, one thing that comes to my mind as I was on the platform all week, it's the stories that bring all the various voices into our conversation. You know, all the people that are part of all the stories that were shared this week, 
of examples of bringing the, the multi-intergenerational conversations together. Those stories carry the voices with them. And I think, I you, think as long as we keep that in mind, um, when we use a platform like this or another format where we can't have all the voices in person, our stories can help bring those voices into the process. So it's a nice steward stewarding of voices. Um, I was thinking about a, an interview I just did with grannies in Uganda and um, how powerful it was for them. They knew that I was going to be carrying their stories to tell people what they wanted the world to know about them. And so they may not have access to internet or be able to speak English, but it was so important to me to steward their voices and share that. So if we can thank you for, for inviting us, Richard, to be very mindful about how we might be able to do that. Um, and bring those voices into our conversations. Yeah. Well, thank um, you so much, Kristen and Peter. We are a little over our time here, and I'd, I'd like to just invite everybody to continue on the platform. And um, as somebody said, I think it was Peter if, or Richard, if, if we can do a, a live conversation like this periodically, we can definitely make that available to people. But um, we welcome everyone to continue. And, and thank you so much, Kristen and Peter, for bringing us together and, and guiding the, the conversations online all week. And thank, thank you so all much, for thank joining you. us today. Bye, folks. Thank you. Thank you so much.